what you say to me. Getting plugged into Instagram yeah. has been a feat, but we've done it. We've done it. Because uh, I'm kind of mobile at the moment. Usually if I'm sitting in the studio, we have it linked yeah. up. But yeah, glad to say I'm here with you. And, uh, yeah. you know, when you're ready, we're live. Yeah, so the first question I would like to ask is, um, where were you born? And, you, and can you tell us about your childhood? Well, I was born in London in london yeah. around the islington part um great childhood i have uh brothers and sisters so we we had fun uh what can i say um i think from i was about uh 10 and a half 11 i was involved to in the um, cinematic world so this was before the days of um, children's TV. So at that time, what happened, the local cinemas would open their doors to children uh, about 12, one o'clock. Uh, it could have been earlier. Um, you know, when mothers are going shopping and it was called Saturday morning pictures. So this was the Children's Film Foundation that made films for children, uh, starring children. And we had a show called The Magnificent Six and a Half about kids um, that would go out and do things and kids would come on Saturday mornings and watch it. Uh, so that was kind of my childhood. Uh, the, the, the later part of my childhood was, was right in the studio. Uh, Boreham Wood, Elstree, Shepparton. So I worked in all the major studios in England. So, I mean, would you say um, in your childhood, would you say you came from a musical family? Not really a musical family. Not, I had an aunt that was an opera singer. But um, generally, my younger sister always, and she dances to this day. Um, that's my sister Lorna. Um, she attended a, a dancing class. And I went yeah. to pick her up one day and... Um, the woman just said to me, can you sing? Um, because of my answer, I ended up being on show. She did a lot of shows with children for charity and lots of different uh, charitable events. And that's that's where I started. So I started singing. Uh, they tried to get me to dance, but, you know, I kind of escaped that one. <laughs> but that, yeah, most of it was, um, was, was dancing and performing. We did... Uh, you know, performed at theatres, um, and then she got me an audition for um, the show that we were just talking about. How did the Rastafari movement influence you and your uh, musical journey? Okay, um, I mean, I, I, as I said, I was a child actor, so yeah. I had many different parts, many different roles uh, in theatre, in, on stage. Um, and normally child actors are usually a lot older than the roles they portray. So I was getting to the age where, you know, I was a lot older. Um, I was beginning to search, that search of, you know, who am I? The music that I was listening to, reggae music at that time was becoming strongly influenced with the teachings of Rastafari. We had songs like uh, Let the Power Fall, Max Romeo. We had Jayute, um, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the black history started through the music 
that that we loved. So um, yeah, the, the 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 music was what guided me towards it, and obviously I started to investigate myself um, as a young black child within the school or the school system. We we were deprived of the the true history of the African race um, and the fact that Africa had great societies, had given the world mathematics and lots of other things that we were never we were never told in school. In school, my heroes were we had the greatest footballer. I mean, at you know, a young age, football was the thing. We had the greatest footballers. We had the greatest cricketers. And if you're a young, if you're a young kid, the greatest thing is we had the greatest fighter. We had Muhammad Ali. You couldn't top that. So yeah. um, to find out that we all came from or, or have a, a great history, um, things like the fact that the electric lights and stuff were invented well not the lights but the actual carbon filament that you know yeah, Lewis Latimer Lewis Latimer and Morgan yeah. Morgan Garrett there's so many yeah. things um the, the real McCoy having met some bewailers after running into Peter Tosh and being introduced by the late great Delray Wilson I mean Delray Washington, Washington. Yeah, could you tell us about um, what um, it was like being um, with the band? Well, as you've, you've told most of the story, but I was working in Neesden. When you're an actor and you're not working, we always term it as you're resting. So you have to find some way of keeping, you know, keeping the things yeah. flowing. Um, so at the Greengrocers in Neesden, and I'm there sorting out the the uh the display the fruit display as used to be in all the old greengrocers and i turned to my right and i saw it i mean to this day it's like a mirage but yeah. coming down the road was peter tosh in the berry uh had a wooden fist on his uh, his chest and uh as if he didn't know i kind of went but you're peter tosh I, I think he must have been a little bit surprised that somebody in the middle of these that because we are talking of early 70s so it's not you know anyway as you said i was surprised and saying delroy i saw peter tosh at that time i only thought it was peter but it turned out that bob uh bunny and peter um family man carly uh Tauter, they, were, they were all there at this house in uh Neesden. Um, situation they were there to support Johnny Nash but they had problems with work visas so for quite a lot of that tour they couldn't play they couldn't work in England and uh, they had no instruments apart from mel melodica was the only instrument that they had in the house at that time and, um, and I had been uh, well, I have to say, rest in peace, a good friend of mine, Junior English. Um, that a, a lot of your listeners may have known. He passed away uh, three or four days ago when I was in Jamaica, I heard. Uh, I had been playing with Junior. Um, and so I had my Marshall amp and speakers and guitars. So I took them down to the house and uh, I would jam family and family wanted me to play bass so we would jam and I remember one day I was there playing the guitar and Bob came in the room and just said pass me the guitar and took the guitar and sat on the bed and started strumming <laughs> so it's surreal now you know when you think about it but funny I was telling this story just a couple of days ago in Jamaica with Julian and Rowan <laughs> and Steve <laughs> so uh, yeah no it was uh, it was a, it was a a time that you, you know it's you can't I, I can't explain it but um to be sitting jamming with because i was a great fan of the whalers anyway i had a little sound system so pre-releases from jamaica and, and, and you know all of those music that came out of out of um scratch really that was the time so uh yeah 
can you reveal some memorable moments that um that you've never shared uh, before about your relationship with the wheelers and their rastafari and musical guidance well i mean you know freddie what it is at the time you don't really think about that it's just yeah. a, a, a moments in life that you 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 know you talk about uh, or, or yeah. you, you don't think about i I think in hindsight, uh, for instance, in Jamaica, you know, they're making a film, the Bob Marley film. Yeah, yeah. So I was invited. I went down to see the set and everything. And you, you remember things and you say things and you go, oh, when we came, we slept here one night. And yeah. you remember those things. But it's it's just something that you do at the time, you know. And it, it's, I think at the time you don't realize what it what it means or what happens is when you think back um so yeah it's it's great moments well uh, one moment that a lot of people don't know about um we were in basin street basin street studios was the island studios that uh labrick in labrick grove and uh one night we went in there there was george the original bass player drummy and myself and we used to go in there because i did not live too far from there um in fact i could see it from one of the windows in my flat so it's pretty close not even a two minutes walk so we went in and we got really upset because the balls out of the football machine had been taken so we sat there for a bit and we were you know as Dude, dudes, you know what I mean? We, we thought they had hidden the balls from us. They didn't want us to come in there. And suddenly the studio door kind of opened and we heard, doom, 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 doom. and it was like a couple of minutes later, Bob came out, stood in the doorway and he saw us, he held us all. We said, hi Bob, da, 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 whatever. And he went back in and you can imagine our excitement. It's like, is Bob doing over one of our tunes? Because it sounds like it, it, it's anyway. Long story short, Bob came out, and uh, Bob was the one that had taken the balls. So the thing that <laughs> it was Bob and I versus George and Drummy, and uh, yeah, they beat us. They beat us. We got a beaten that day. So could you name three musical influence influences that you abs absolutely love um, that shaped your unique writing and vocal style? Um, we, well, we've talked about one. I think Bob uh, is yes. one of the most incredible writers of the 20th century. I mean, his music just never, never dates. I've heard stories of all rock guitarists that were on tour. Yes. And when it came to playing music, one would say, oh, no, I don't like that kind of rock. I don't like this kind of rock. And the only music that seemed to be able to satisfy all of their tastes was Bob Marley. So Bob Marley, definitely. Um, I'm There's so many, but I'm just going to dig deep. Uh, Sam Cooke. Sam, I, I love Sam Cooke. Um, there's so many others, but I label him probably the grandfather of, of kind of the sound of reggae. And that's got to be Curtis Mayfield. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and as you know the, the whalers when the group was down to three i think they followed the harmony structure of the miracles so um yeah and i think most of most people would agree that curtis's music is well even bob himself he took people get ready so mm. yeah i hope i hope that's a good three how did the um on underground smash movie babylon come to be and um, how did you get the lead role? Babylon came about, I got a call to audition for a, I, I didn't know what anything about it. Uh, but I went down, I met Franco Rosso and Martin Stellman. Um, Franco Rosso is the director and writer and Martin Stellman is the writer. He wrote um, Quadrafina as well. Um, and they 
knew that I, I was acting. They knew that I was in, in a band and uh, I, I was successful with the audition. Uh, and uh, as I was saying to you, that when you're doing things, you probably don't have, you don't have a thought of what it means. But I think uh, 40 years later, to watch Babylon in the Ambassador Theatre, which is the home of, of where reggae really kicked off all that whole music. Uh, it was the, the place that they had all the talent competitions and Alton Ellis and Orted Sellis and lots of people started their careers there. there and then to perform with the Edel Man, the orchestra and uh, um, yeah, I, I would never have thought that 40 years later I'd be touring America and the film would be shown in Brooklyn and things like that. So, well, As I toured Britain and Europe with the great Burning Spear, which led to a live album released on the Island Records. So can you tell us about that and share some untold memories from that tour? <laughs> well, that, that made me, that made me out to be a liar. <laughs> that. Yeah. He's my brother. I won't even say friend. It's my brother, um, Drummy. Yeah. Um, when he came into the record shop on the Harrow Road, or Gangster Village, as it is known, um, he came in and I had these adverts up because I was looking for musicians to join the band. I was just looking for the right yeah. people. Um, he came in and um, he said he was playing with uh, the Steel Band, the Metro Steel Band. He was playing with Delroy and uh, he's, I think that's some so another musical situation. And I said to him, look, this band is not going to be a backing band. We're never going to be a backing band. We're doing and writing our own material. We're telling our story from our point of view. Um, and I just said, you know, you know all these things. You, if, if, you know, you've got to be focused on one band. So obviously he went away. But um, why I say that? We had been playing for for quite a while. Uh, I think people begun to know Aswad and the sound of Aswad, even though at that time there was uh, it was just I don't know this feeling that English music wasn't authentic. It wasn't, it wasn't the real deal. Um, but, you know, we'd been playing and I think we'd started to make waves and, and, and we were playing dub on stage. We were using a real PA as opposed to most bands were using two column speakers. And they would, when the sound system decided they had enough, the sound system could turn up and uh, they would be drowned out but we were using a PA and if the sound system tried which many did we would turn up and you know we had it wasn't a massive PA but it was a when PA was a good size thing and we were we were playing dub on stage and we had an echo plex and so we we I think we were creating a, a different sound that people weren't used to hearing and then we got the call that uh, Burning Spear was on yeah. tour. It didn't have a band and would we... So this is why I say it made me out to be a liar because we said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who would say yes, say no to Burning Spear? But um, we had we had a great tour with him. We learned a lot from uh, Bobby Ellis, who was the trumpet player and the MD of the band. And... Um, Later that year, we had our first musical trip, excuse, we had our first musical trip to Jamaica, to Harry J Studios. And while there, the Compton brothers, who were Jamaican tennis players, said, listen, you guys are here, you're all here, we've got to put on a show. You can't come to Jamaica and not do a show. So in a place called Caesar's Palace, we did a show, our first ever show in Jamaica. And we then called out Burning Spear. And at that time, no one had really seen Burning Spear. They all knew Burning Spear, they knew the music, but very few people had seen him live. So um, we then played again with Burning Spear in Jamaica. I thought that the Harry J Studio had closed down 
and yeah. I just returned from Jamaica where I worked on production with some good friends from Argentina, a band called Non Paladese. And uh, we're great friends. We've toured South America and Argentina. And um, I got them into Harry J. And Tara is now, that's Harry J's daughter, is now looking after the studio. So it, it, was, it was great. We were looking at all the, the main studio is the same. And you know that was the studio where Bob did the first, his first five albums from Catch a Fire right the way through. Um, now this is where we went the very first time to, to Jamaica. And the first time we entered Harry J, uh, there was a vocalist that he was just finishing. So we hadn't really heard his voice. Anyway, suddenly it was like, yeah, okay, you have it. And out of the studio came Jacob Miller. And Yo. it was like, he just went, whoa, the guys come from England. And we, <laughs> oh, we just rapped and, and then just talked about that. That was, that was great. He was the first artist that we saw kind of in the studio in Jamaica. Um, we had some crazy times. We, as I told you, we ended up doing the show. Um, but we ended up in a place called Content Gap. Now, Content Gap, if you know Jamaica, is above Popping. You have like Gordon Town and you go up. And uh, when we were there in Content Gap, it's like the clouds were around our feet. It's, it's really high. And um, we would have to go to get water from a, a pipe. And we had like this big tin, it's like a, a cheese tin. We would go out, fill it with water. But yeah. kind of George and I kind of probably were the first couple to go and do it. And uh, we would, when the others went to do it, we would, we would be sitting there just laughing and thinking, okay, what's going to happen now? <laughs> because you fill this thing up with water and if you're holding it like this, by the time you get halfway up the, the hill, it's you're going up, back up the hill, the water's empty. And the only way you can carry this water was on your head. <laughs> but um, yeah, we had crazy times because people would be like an hour trying to get this water. And one of the other things I remember was um, Drummy had this brown crombie. And when we were going to Jamaica, it was like, what are you doing? Why are you going to take this coat to Jamaica? <laughs> what are you doing? Anyway, when we got up there, you needed it because, yeah, it was cold up there. So he had the last laugh on us. But there were many, many, many different times that, you know, we could go into. But maybe I won't go into all the other stories, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy times. We ran into a roadblock and, and one of the Mighty Diamonds was, he was a soldier at that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, enough, enough little things. I mean, a great term, drummer um, Angus Gay, also known as Drummy Zebra, um, passed away last year in September. So can you share some um, special moments with with him and tell us about how influential he was in terms of producing and um, engineering for Aswad besides singing and drumming? Drummy is a phenomenal musician. Okay, yeah. absolutely remarkable. From the time, I mean, when when. Drummy signed for Ireland, his mother had to sign because he was 16, so Drummy couldn't sign. And he just loved the board. He just loved the board. He was on there. And at that time, like now you have a motorized situation, so you can actually set something in motion and it will happen because you have automatic faders at that time we had to press buttons and like four or five of us and right you hold that side and you do that side and you do this side um just amazing i mean people know the music they know the voice um he was just incredible he was just absolutely incredible and we had so much fun i remember coming back from jamaica uh one time and uh, we were sitting in my flat and we had a couple of friends with us. Um, some of the sisters from Brown Sugar, Karen, and, and, and we decided, okay, like Jamaica, how we could just go to the beach, we would just do that. And 
Jomi, Cara and Pauline and I decided to drive to, to Brighton because we were in England now, but we wanted to relive that time of being able to go to the beach and chill. So we got to, we got there, we got to drove along the front of Brighton, got out, walked on the beach. And by the time we came back to the car, we were surrounded by police and <laughs> we were locked up. <laughs> So, yeah, there's so many stories I could tell you, Freddie, but, you know, sometimes to really relay them and, and, and get them out now, it's a little bit difficult, but phenomenal, phenomenal mu musicians, Tony Gad, phenomenal musician. I mean, absolutely great. And, and there's moments that I shared with, with Drummy that just a moment of just, we glance at each other on stage and just know what we were going to do or say something and the harmony came out um i think someone i was on a plane once and this woman that was she was now a businesswoman but she had been a hippie she explained aswad she said you guys are like the trace elements of dynamite he said on their own they are just elements put them together mm -hmm and they're explosive. And I think she tied it up in a way that probably I've never looked at or heard it been said before. So I mean, could you also speak about some, um, because this is one of my favorite albums of all time, um, New Chapter, New Chapter. So I mean, could you speak to us about um, um, the recording process and stuff? And could you speak to us about, um, you know, working with Mikey Campbell? Mikey. Um, this is the time of dub, of dub music, mm. um, where engineers, they took the front seat. Yeah. New, chap new chapter is taken from the album that we released with CBS at that time, which was New, new, new Chapter. Okay. And that's the title of that album, which has the vocal versions. Okay. Um, and it was we loved dub we loved dub and, and we made dub everything that we did they had to be a dub version mikey rest in peace um and also george oban the original bass player rest in peace um it was just something we loved and so we had to have a dub of of, of everything we did and obviously the album when we approached uh cbs with it they said, what, what, what good is this? There's no, I mean, we are talking about early days when the whole dub situation was unknown to the record companies. They had no idea of how they could promote it or distribute it. Um, so it was early days. It was something we loved. Now dub is the basis of all modern day music. Uh, you know, they're just just the, that space and and the fact of rhythms and stuff that people use. It all came from from dubs. You speak about some like what you think of um, the the idea, uh, you know, the ideology of repatriation, black people, um, you know, repatriating and, and things. So, could you speak to us about um, your you know your opinions on that? Well. we have to look at where it all started mm. to build to build the economies of europe yeah. starting with the portuguese the english the spanish the french they all grabbed from africa because africa has the natural resource natural resources many of us our ancestors were brought to different parts of the world to satisfy the hunger of the Western world, of those worlds that were called developed. We now know that a lot of what they learned, they learned from Africa, because it wasn't the Greeks. It wasn't those, those all of the philosophers that they talk about were studied in Africa, in the universities that were in Africa. So what, we, what we're saying now first it has to be a repatriation of your mind okay and this is what i think rastafari gave i have to speak for myself personally 
the fact of understanding that we had great civilizations in at times where probably those in England were still living in caves, right? Um, and for some, we have a right to return to our homelands. You know, we, we, no matter where you come from, you're black, you're an African. And in reality, whether you're white, Chinese, whatever, life started in Africa. Okay, so basically, we're all African. Um, whether you're one that is looking for a monetary um, handout to return to Africa, that's another question. But I think, first of all, we have to start in our minds and we have to look towards the unification of Africa because we will never have economical strength if we're kept divided. This is something that, you know, you look at Lord Macaulay or whatever, who, who spoke to the, 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 the English parliament. And he said, I've traveled across the breadth of Africa and I've not seen one beggar. I've not seen one per poor person. I've not seen any violence. Okay, and I have the news cut in, All right? He said, if we want to conquer these people, we have to make them believe that what they have is no good and what we have is good. Okay. So, it was devised for us to come and do the bidding of a few. And repatriation, first it has to start in your mind, but like myself, I'm looking to Africa, I just came back from, from Zambia. Because the way the media portrays Africa, and the way the media portrays all these hungry, starving children, you've got hungry, starving children right here in England. You've got hungry, starving children in, in, in America, right? China, all of those places. Africa is beautiful. Africa is beautiful, but the mentality can be a problem because people believe what they see on the media. But, you know, you have to see it for yourself. Um, so, yeah, it's a thing that we're entitled to look to our homeland we're entitled to be able to go and assist and i think as soon as people realize how beautiful africa is um, we can start getting together i'm not talking about separatism or whatever but as a black man i have to speak for my culture and my my nation just as anyone else speaks for theirs and no one has a problem with it um but i think sometimes guilt plays a big part and you know fingers are pointed and saying oh you just want to do this but you know just i was i don't really because i don't live in england now i don't hear a lot of the news but i mean there's a report on the metropolitan police and from what i'm understanding nothing has changed in x amount of years so you know as long as we have no economical strength. We will be pushed around because it's been described. It's like a flyweight boxer getting into the ring with heavyweights. So until we beef up and, and, and be united, we're going to have the same problem. And we're still going to be asking questions about repatriation. And the thing is, it's talked about, but people do not see the beauty of where we're talking about going to, you know, yeah. and if you're able, it's like if you are in your own home and you can make no decisions in your home where you are, then there's a problem. So that's the problem we face with Africa. For us to talk seriously about repatriation, we have to be united and be able to stand and say, look, we want to protect our citizens, you know, and then maybe there won't be so many people being beaten in police stations or whatever because we will have the strength of our uh, ambassadors or whatever that comes and says, look, hold on, you can't do this. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an important thing, but something we can't really explain in the time that we have, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because even Marcus, Marcus Garvey was like, a people without the knowledge of their past, you know, history, origin and culture, like a root of our uh, 
Yeah. What was it? You know, don't do a, a, a nation without the, the knowledge of their, their, their history yeah. or have no history. I mean, yeah. who are they? You know, we For go real, to school yeah. and we learn about Christopher Columbus and, and a lot of those people who turned out to be pirates. They were they were paid mercenaries, you know. So you know what it, what it is. History is created by the victors. So now with the knowledge that we have and the event of the internet that allows us to to be able to learn things that we probably wouldn't have seen before or wouldn't have picked up a book to read we can now see it and we start to learn the truth of the things but you know one's not without the other you know we we are we are whoever you are whatever you are what skin color or whatever you are or where you come from you're a human being and we're talking about the we're talking about the system that needs to be changed and that's what we talk about you know and after finally achieving musical success um with a number one in, in the uk charts with don't turn around acting with um success with babylon and broadcasting success with the bbc um what's next for brinsley ford um a new album's on the way it's going to be a special album um and i think you know, it's every time you do something, hopefully you 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 learn how to present it that bit better than you, your last uh, achievement. I'm working with um, Jason Jermaine, it's my son, um, and he's got a. I mean, a lot of people don't know uh, the things that he's done. Uh, he used to run Freddie McGregor's studio. He actually was the one that did the song the first song for capital when they started calling him profit um people like uh, mr vegas mr vegas uh, received a mobo award and i was interviewing him because i was at vh1 then and he said really i should give this reward uh, award to you and i thought well, what what do you mean he said your son was the first person to take me to studio so there's lots of people like that that um i think he was a youth at that time and and youths that couldn't get the break it was easier to work with him and you know many many of the artists that uh, are now out there doing stuff um, he he brought them through and another uh, great um producer is jazzwood now jazzwood yeah. Jazz used to come to our rehearsal. He was like seven, eight at that time. And yeah. uh, every day we were rehearsing, he made sure he came. So it's nice to be working with people I've known from from before. And uh, they're now out there and, and, and I'm, I'm working with them and learning, you know, because um, you can always learn. And the scripture says, you know, out of the mouths of babes and suckling. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working with them. And there's another situation, um, but I'm not going to say too much about that now because we only spoke about it. And once we start, then I can talk about it. But um, yeah, I had some, some other um, young musicians from uh, that are well known, but that time will come. I'll be able to talk about it soon. So, yeah, a new album. A new album and i'll be back on the road um but yeah you have to watch this space and see what happens so i mean could you speak to us about um you know your your encounter with um bonnie wheeler delroy yeah. and i were having a discussion about rastafari and bunny took us you know took us aside and we had this conversation similar to reincarnated souls um so yeah bunny bunny was a great teacher and i love his his album black heart man i think that's one of the most spiritual albums out there and to sit and reason with him about things that you were just learning as i said you know i was learning about the music 
and Bunny had a good grasp of it and learnt a lot from Bunny. So uh, yeah, Bunny's one of the great souls of the music. I mean, there were several times I think for Dennis Brown and they asked me to do a uh, tribute to, to, to D Brown uh, and I called uh, Jomi and Tony for us to do it and we went out there and did it. The Island uh, 50th uh, did the same thing so you know we're, we're never never in a situation where we couldn't do anything you know back in the day I think most bands have a problem because one person walks away with the with the with the money because they're the main writer and in 1981 I shared my royalties with everyone so we never had a, we never had maybe the reason to have arguments like most other bands do you know so uh yeah we we've always been we've always been brothers and that's it you know we've been singing about it for years um you know but like brothers we have times when we you know disagree with each other that's only natural but um yeah, yeah. yeah to answer your question yeah, that possibility is always there. That possibility is always there. Yes, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, it's been a great pleasure, you know. Great pleasure having you on the show, um, you know, reasoning and, and things. So, I mean, what what, um, what do you, what do you want to say to your fans out there who, you know, listen to you, who love you? Yeah. Well, what I really would like to say right now is yeah. when when I started personally, I look around and there was no one that I can recognize doing jobs that could be done to, to document our history and our story. Um, so I would turn this on to you, Freddie. I love the fact that now I can see, like yourself, having your own podcast, interviewing people you, you you're documenting the history and when you tell it you're going to tell it with the way that we season our lives i mean before we had many great journalists but i used the food as a as a way to explain it you know if you have certain cultures they season their food in in different ways and use different different herbs and spices to explain their culinary story and this is what i'm saying that i love the fact now to look around we've got like yourself doing podcasts we've got young directors we've got young cameramen we've got writers we've got people working on all sides of the industry so you know in in in, in the words of shine because when i was talking to linford christie and and, and ian wright they were saying, listen, man, you guys were an inspiration to us. And I said, listen, your work and what you're doing, you'll be an inspiration to many young kids out there. And that's the meaning of shine. I don't know if a lot of people understand what shine's about, but it starts like I burn like a fire left in the rain. So if you think about the struggle of that, of young athletes, of, of, of you know, musicians, of, of people like yourself, who have got to, you know, you've got to put the work in to, 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 to achieve your goal, what you want. So, you know, total respect to all those young people who are doing work and doing things that are so necessary. So, um, yeah, I'll keep on playing music and hopefully I'll be able to come and, and on your show again. And, you know, why shouldn't Freddie have a TV show in a couple of months' time? You know what I mean? So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the the effort and the work of the young people who have got so much, I think, more advantages than we had in the early days. You know, the internet, you can do your own show, you can do your own TV show, you can do, you know. So it's, yeah, I, I'll, I'll turn that one back on, like yourself and other people who are doing stuff. That's important. Yes, yeah, you all, yeah, thank you once again. Thank you once again for, you know, the kind words and, yeah, ha having the time to reason with us, you know. It's been a great pleasure to, you know, have you on the show and things. So, yeah. 
Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, man. Tuned in. Yeah, man. Um, the co co owner of the show, Kaya Kaya man, um, sends you sends you sends you his greetings. Yeah. So, no respect to, and a yes, big sir. thank you to all those people who have tuned in. You know. Yes. Um, yeah, man. Keep 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 doing it, and yeah. uh, it's important for all the people who tuned in to be tuning in to you because it keeps your show going, and later on you'll be able to do your advertising or whatever. So, it's a big. Thanks a big, uh, much love to everyone. Thank you once again, Brinsley, for having the time to read some of us. Um, have a much blessed love, day. Man. Much love. Take care, man. Bless. Peace and unity, that's what we need in the world's community. Do you get me? All oh, God bless you, this West, North and South. Jalou, that's what we're about. Trying, I get some will try in vain. Some will do the best they can, while others keep their best inside them. Hearts are bleeding, and now we're living on the bread. Dancing on a rainbow's edge, as if they just don't care. We'll be jumping. Are you picking up now? I'm picking it up, I'm picking it up. Oppression and depression, nations in a turbine, recession and economical. Life.